Air travel is a marvel of engineering and ingenuity, but still, for all the benefits it provides, air transportation easily remains the riskiest way to go. A slight error in the technical aspects of the plane or the pilot's flying skills, and things can go really wrong. Now, whenever any major aviation incident happens, one of the first courses of action is to recover the plane's black box. It's basically a device that provides useful information about all the events that led to the crash, and part of that information is available in the audio recordings of the pilots. In this video, we'll be looking at a few of these recordings, as well as the chilling reactions of pilots as they tried hard to salvage their situations. Join us as we have a look at the most disturbing recordings before plane crashes. Swiss Air Flight 111 More often than not, airplane crashes are caused by terrible technical errors that put the lives of everyone at stake. That was the classic case of the doomed Swiss Air Flight 111. A scheduled passenger flight, the Swiss Air 111, took off from John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York City with the aim of transporting 229 passengers and crew to an airport in Geneva, Switzerland. But while everyone got ready for takeoff, little did they know that the flight was pretty much doomed already. The flight would take off from JFK around 8.18 p.m., September the 2nd of 1998, and almost immediately things began to go wrong. First, it would experience a radio blackout for around 13 minutes, one which was later found to have been due to radio tuning errors. And about 52 minutes into the flight, the crew would notice a smell in the cockpit while the plane flew over Yarmouth, a town in Canada. Do you smell something? Yeah, what is that? They discovered it was smoke from the AC system, and while it receded, it soon returned much worse a few moments later. The pilots would immediately make an emergency call to Montcon Air Traffic Control in Nova Scotia, and after a few back and forth, they eventually tried to make an emergency landing at a local airport. Left uh, heading 0304 to Swiss Air 111. Okay, it's a back course approach for runway 06, the localizer frequency 109 decimal niner. You've got 30 miles to fly to the threshold. But here's the thing though, because they carried so much fuel, it was important to dump some of it to reduce their weight and make for a safer landing. So they moved a bit towards St. Margaret's Bay where they could safely dump fuel while remaining within a safe distance of the airport. Following the Swiss Air's checklist, the crew had shut off power to the cabin, a move which also turned off the recirculating fans and allowed the fire to spread through the cockpit. And just like that, the aircraft's autopilot was gone. A few moments later, the crew declared that they had to fly manually. Uh, Swiss uh, 111, at the time, we must fly uh, manually. Are we clear to fly between uh, 11,000 and 9,000 feet? Then, the crew made another emergency call. We're starting dump now. We have to land immediately. Swiss Air 111, just a couple of miles. I'll be right with you. And we are declaring emergency now. Swiss Air 111. Copy that. And that was it. The aircraft data recorder stopped operating at 10.25 p.m., and six minutes later, it struck the ocean at an estimated speed of 345 miles per hour. The collision caused the aircraft to disintegrate entirely, killing everyone on board. Polish Air Force 101 When it comes to airplanes, it should come as no surprise that not all of them are built the same way. I mean, some airplanes are for commercial purposes, like those that you and I get on when we need to travel, and then there are those planes that are reserved for presidents and heads of state. These ones are the real deal, and with all the reinforcement and added features that they get, you rarely hear that presidential planes crash, but there are some rare occurrences when they do. Back in April of 2010, the world would be horrified by the Smolensk air disaster, the crash of a Tupolev Tu-154 aircraft that had been dubbed the Polish Air Force Flight 101. The aircraft was carrying several major members of Poland's government, which included the president at the time, the first lady, the former president, the chief of the Polish general staff, the head of the Polish National Bank, and almost 20 members of parliament, amongst others. Apparently, the crew had been coming back from a diplomatic event in Warsaw and were heading to a former military base at Smolensk. 
But upon their descent, the pilots had underestimated the amount of fog that they were facing. With visibility reduced to just about 500 meters, the aircraft went far below the normal approach path, hitting trees and crashing straight into the ground. And the audio recordings just before the plane crash were incredibly chilling. To make things worse, investigations into the crash would find that there was nothing wrong with the plane itself. So it appears it was simply the case of bad weather and unprepared pilots. All 96 passengers on this flight had lost their lives, and it was a huge loss for the Polish people. The country's Air Force unit was disbanded, and many high-ranking members of its military resigned as well. Japan Airlines Flight 123 on August the 12th of 1985, Japan would be hit with what many still believe to be the worst aviation event in the long history of the country to date, and which coincidentally remains the deadliest single aircraft crash in the history of aviation. On that day, a Japan Airlines flight dubbed Flight 123 was set to travel from Tokyo to Osaka. It was a pretty normal flight that had happened several times, and as you'd imagine, no one really thought that anything would go wrong. But just 12 minutes into the flight, everything went wrong. According to reports, the aircraft itself suffered a sudden explosive decompression only moments after leaving the ground, and this would result in the loss of the plane's hydraulic systems and rudder, all of which meant that the pilot was pretty much left on his own. Lower the nose. Lower the nose. Yes. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down. So put the gear down. Credit to the crew, though. They managed to keep the craft airborne for a full half hour, but after that, it was goodnight Irene for Flight 123. The aircraft, a Boeing 747, mind you, crashed in the area around Mount Takamagara. Now, considering how ghastly the incident was, you can imagine how chilling the recordings in the cockpit were, and trust me, they were pretty cold. According to reports, the issue would be caused by a faulty repair job that had been done on the plane a few years earlier, and with the maintenance on the plane being so poor, that issue appeared to have intensified to the point where the crash had to happen. All in all, Flight 123 carried a total of 524 passengers, and when the craft crashed, 505 of them, along with 15 crew members, were instantly killed. Some of the passengers did survive the initial impact, but sadly lost their lives while awaiting rescue and evacuations as their injuries were just too extensive. PSA Flight 182 If you've seen any classic plane crash movies, you may be familiar with those scenes where people on doomed flights call their loved ones to tell them how much they mean to them and all of that stuff. And while these things may seem a bit overly dramatic, I do have to say there really is a new perspective that it kind of brings you when you hear it from someone who's actually in a life or death situation. For a little bit of context, we should consider the case of Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 182. This flight was scheduled to move from Sacramento to Los Angeles and San Diego on September the 25th of 1978 with a Boeing 727 aircraft servicing the journey. But only a few moments into the flight, the PSA crew would be alerted by an approach controller about a small Cessna 172 that was flying nearby. The Cessna was apparently being flown by two unlicensed pilots, with one of them apparently using it to practice instrument landing system approaches, and since they had departed from Montgomery Field and were flying under visual flight rules, they didn't need to have a flight plan. To make things even worse, the main pilot of the Cessna, a 35-year-old U.S. Marine Corps sergeant named David Boswell, had apparently been wearing a hood that limited his field of vision and blocked his peripheral view. That all being said, records would show that the PSA flight crew also had a little bit of blame for this. For one, they had failed to follow the proper flight procedures when they lost sight of the Cessna by failing to alert air traffic control, and the traffic controllers themselves were said to have cut some corners. The collision between the Cessna and the PSA was pretty ghastly. Both planes crashed in a busy intersection in North Park, a neighborhood in San Diego with the collision killing all 135 people on board the PSA flight and another seven people on the ground. The two people aboard the Cessna also perished as well, with nine other people on the ground being injured as a result of their debris. 
All of this is pretty sad, but just wait until you hear the recording in the cockpit as the pilot knew that it was all over. While the words appeared to have been lost in the noise, some people claim that the last words of the pilot of the PSA flight were, Ma, I love you. To date, the collision between both planes remains the deadliest air disaster in the history of California. And considering the state's history with plane crashes, that's really saying something. Aero Peru Flight 603 These days, it's pretty commonplace to see a flight moving through different countries and making stops, but this actually starts to take hold back in the 80s and 90s, when planes themselves were also somewhat becoming commonplace. When the Aero Peru Flight 603 took off from Miami International Airport on October 1st of 1996, everyone thought things would be fine. The flight was set to travel from Miami to the Arturo Marino Benitez International Airport in Santiago, Chile, while making stopovers at a few other places. Everything seemed pretty solid on the first day. The flight moved all the way from Miami to Lima, with 119 of the 180 passengers coming off and the rest being transferred to a Boeing 757 for the last leg of the flight. That last leg began about 42 minutes after midnight on October the 2nd, and almost immediately, the crew discovered that their basic flight instruments had been behaving weird. For one, they reported that they were getting contradictory messages from the flight management computer, especially regarding the metrics such as altitude, rudder ratio, airspeed, and more. They immediately requested an emergency return to the airport. But here's the thing. The pilots believed that they could just ask air traffic controllers about the aircraft's altitude, and what they didn't know, however, was that the data from the controllers had also been compromised. Climb, 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 climb. With a general lack of reliable information and constant contradictory warnings from the in-flight computer, the pilots believed that they were at a safe altitude. And so, they began the descent. And what they didn't know was that they were above water at the time, and you can see where this one's going. On the ground, the air traffic controller noticed what was happening and immediately ordered a different flight to take off and help the Aero Peru flight to land. But it was too late. A few moments later, the Boeing 757's left wingtip clipped the water, tearing it off almost entirely. And you can only imagine how much the pilot had tried to keep everyone from going down. The pilot had done his best after the first collision with the water, but it was too little too late. At that point, with the damage done to the left wing, the aircraft rolled over and slammed into the water. Everyone on the flight had sadly lost their lives, and it sparked a massive outrage at the time about the quality of tools and equipment that was being used on planes. But still, I doubt that this would make up for the fact that people literally died because of the negligence of some others. Air Florida Flight 90 when it comes to aircraft crashes, there are those that you can avoid, and there are those that just happen due to circumstances out of everyone's control. Somehow, the Air Florida Flight 90 crash kind of had elements of both. Operated by Air Florida, this aircraft was scheduled to leave from Washington National Airport, and what we now call the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, to Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International, albeit with a short stop at the Tampa International Airport as well. Several factors actually contributed to the crash, and the first would be the weather. The flight had been scheduled for January the 13th of 1982, and the entire Washington airport was pretty much covered in ice. A snowstorm had hit the region, producing up to six and a half inches of snow, and while the airport had been closed off, it eventually reopened that afternoon under marginal conditions. So at the time, when this flight would be scheduled for departure, there was still some moderate snowfall. To add to this, the pilots themselves had apparently been ill-equipped to handle flights under those conditions, and as such, they, as well as the ground crew, had implemented subpar de-icing procedures for the plane. Despite the fact that the plane had pretty much been delayed for over an hour before taking off, the pilots chose not to activate the engine's anti-icing system. To make things even worse, the captain allegedly ignored warnings from the second officer when he recommended that they hold off on taking off because the engine's temperature was cooler than expected.
Instead of calling off the takeoff, the captain continued to move, choosing to take off anyways. Eventually, the flight barely even made it off the ground. It got airborne, but it only achieved a maximum altitude of 350 feet before making a descent. All in all, the flight was off the ground for only 30 seconds when it crashed into the 14th Street Bridge across the Potomac, hitting six cars and a truck on the bridge before plunging into the freezing river. When it was all said and done, four crew members, including both pilots, lost their lives, while 70 out of the 74 passengers also died. 19 occupants were believed to have survived, but they couldn't escape due to the extent of their injuries. Avianca Flight 52 in the next clip, we'll be looking at yet another aircraft that seemingly crashed as a result of inclement weather. The Avianca Flight 52 was an international flight that was scheduled to move from Bogota, Colombia to New York City via Medellin on January the 25th of 1990. Befitting a flight happening in January, this one took place at a period where the weather was not necessarily favorable, but unlike the Air Florida flight, this one was manned by a highly experienced crew. Even still, the weather managed to mess with them in a cruel way. The flight departed Bogota at around 1.10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and landed at Medellin at 2.04. When they got to Medellin, it was then that the craft had about 67,200 pounds of fuel left. However, the flight plan for JFK International Airport would call for more than that, and this would have included the main fuel, the reserve fuel, the alternate fuel, and the holding fuel and so they were pretty short to say the least. Instead of taking in the required amount, the dispatcher and pilot decided to use a separate runway to land, meaning that they needed just an extra 2,000 pounds instead of the 12,000 that was required. And this is where things went wrong. You see, at this point, it was freezing cold in New York, and because of that, several flights that were trying to land were unable to. Instead, they were being told to hold and circle around in the air for a while while ground controllers worked to clear runways. Despite first entering American airspace at around 528, the flight would be delayed and told to circle several times, so much so that it was still in the air by 8.30 p.m. By a few minutes past 9, the pilots were beginning to get nervous, and they communicated this to the air traffic controllers. I'm in the 052, you're making the left turn, correct, sir? That's right, 2180, we're on the heading, and uh, we'll try once again, we're running out of fuel. They were eventually cleared for landing, but the craft had pretty much maxed out their fuel and were unable to make it down. And for the traffic controllers, it became a pretty chilling thing to hear them try to make contact with the aircraft and have no success. Avianca 052, you have, uh, uh, you have enough fuel to make it to the airport? Avianca 052, New York. According to the National Transportation Safety Board, the plane had crashed at that point, descending without any power, clipping a few posts and trees, and crashing straight into a hill in Cove Neck, New York. 73 out of the 158 people on board would die, while 72 adults and children over the age of three who had survived would sustain some pretty nasty injuries. Delta Airlines Flight 191 on August the 2nd of 1985, a Lockheed L-1011 TriStar aircraft operating Delta Airlines Flight 191 would be carrying 150 passengers and two crew members from Fort Lauderdale to Los Angeles with an intermediate stop at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Before takeoff, the flight's dispatch weather forecast for Dallas-Fort Worth had stated that there could be a few scattered rain showers and thunderstorms. A separate alert had warned of an area of isolated thunderstorms over Oklahoma and northern and eastern Texas. Now, still though, reviewing these notices, the flight crew decided to forge on, and as the craft made its way past New Orleans, a weather formation near the Gulf Coast got worse. And the flight crew decided to deviate from the planned route. They were eventually cleared by the Fort Worth air traffic controllers to descend at 10,000 feet, but decided to fly toward the Blue Ridge approach. With the plane finally set to land, it suddenly got hit by a deadly phenomenon called a microburst. Essentially, the plane's airspeed suddenly and drastically dropped, and this would be followed by a rushing column of air that had forced the craft towards the ground. The pilots had already been at low altitude, and so they tried to get the plane back up to give them enough leverage to land. Way up. Way up. 
It was too little too late at that point. The plane had struck the ground on the runway before bouncing again and crossing over the highway. The plane's engine eventually struck a car on the highway, all before finally cartwheeling into a large water tank and then exploding. Ultimately, 137 people were killed as a result of the crash, which included eight out of the 11 crew members. The driver of the vehicle involved in the collision also sadly lost his life. GOL Flight 1907 Known to many as the GOL flight, GOL Transportes Eros Flight 1907 was a passenger flight that was scheduled to move within many locations in Brazil. The flight would be taking a total of 148 passengers and six crew members on the trip, all aboard a Boeing 737 airliner. It departed Eduardo Gomes International Airport on September the 29th of 2006, planning to stop at Brasilia while en route to Rio. But there was a bit of a wrench in the works, at the same time, a newly built twin-turbofan Embraer Legacy 600 business jet was on a delivery flight by Excel Air from the Embraer factory to the United States. It had departed an airport close to Sao Paulo and was en route to the airport in Manaus as an intermediate stop. It carried a crew of just two pilots as well as four employees and Joe Sharkey, a New York Times business travel columnist who was writing a special report on the business jet service. Normally, two planes flying so close to each other should not be an issue, but for some reason, they got so close that they actually ended up colliding. According to reports, the left winglet of the Embraer had sheared off about half of the Boeing's left wing, causing the latter to nosedive and spin uncontrollably. Now, you can just feel the frantic attempts at rescuing this aircraft from the pilots and the crew, but none of it mattered. The Boeing eventually crashed into an area of very dense rainforest, and the final collision led to the entire aircraft being completely wrecked. Every single person on this plane perished, and as for the Embraer, the jet was able to keep on flying although its crew had to land the crippled jet at Kanchimbo Airport, a part of the more large military complex. Pilots were eventually detained and charged for their role in the collision, and eventually being sentenced to four years and four months in prison in May of 2011. El Al Flight 1862 To round things up, we'll take you back to October the 4th of 1992, when a Boeing 747 cargo aircraft belonging to Israeli airline El Al, was traveling from JFK to Ben Gurion International Airport in Tel Aviv, Israel. The plane had made a stopover at Amsterdam Airport in the Netherlands, and on that flight, three main issues had been noticed. The autopilot speed regulation was shaky, the radio was problematic, and the inboard engine on the right wing was also not performing at full capacity. These issues would be fixed, according to technicians, and the plane was refueled and sent back to the skies once more for the final lap to Tel Aviv. On board the flight were the pilot, first officer, a flight engineer, and a single passenger who happened to be an El Al employee. And once the flight got airborne, things kind of began to go downhill. Witnesses claimed that they'd heard a sharp bang and saw flying debris when the flight was above the Goumier, a lake near Amsterdam, Engine number three had separated from the aircraft's right wing, shot forward, and damaged the wing slats. Then it fell back and hit engine number four, tearing into the right wing. Both of the engines fell from the aircraft, ripping off more of its wings, and this action would cause the plane to roll. Interestingly enough, the pilots believed that both engines had only failed and not fallen out entirely, and still, due to hydraulic failures, they decided to try and go back to Amsterdam. As the pilots would try to land, they found that the damage on the leading edge prevented the slats on the wings from deploying. This caused an airflow imbalance, which meant that the plane had begun to roll into the right. This would be the end, and the plane made a sharp nosedive, crashing into an apartment block and pretty much cutting in two. Despite the pilots' best efforts, there was absolutely nothing that could be done. The resulting explosion would be ghastly. It led to the death of everyone on board, as well as a further 39 people on the ground. 26 others would sustain injuries, and 11 of those were injuries that required long-term hospital treatment. 
Now honestly, some of these recordings are very harrowing, and it's a good thing that aviation technology has advanced so much, but you can really never take a chance. What do you think though? Which of these situations was more troubling to you? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.